Okay, Henry, what are your thoughts? These bits go up and down, this bit goes up and down, and the tires go. <laughs> Hello, I'm Henry and welcome to the Down Country Field Test. Now, Trek are old hands at the 120mm Travel Lark by now. And in fact, this is a new bike to the category, the Top Fuel. But from the outside, it might seem like there's been a bit of musical chairs in Trek's lineup in recent years. This bike, which has gone through versions of XC Racer, Marathon Racer, and now XC Trail Bike, is the Top Fuel and it's the 120mm bike here to stay. Naming confusion to one side, this is now their downcountry troublemaker. The bike uses 29 inch wheels, except for the extra small, which uses 27.5, and a 120mm platform paired to a 120mm fork. The bike now comes in seven, yes, seven different sizes, and has a whole plethora of build kits with both SRAM and Shimano and that's not even mentioning their Project One custom build kit. So to say their options would be something of an understatement. Now you've seen the silhouette and I know what you're thinking. Yes, it looks like an Ellsworth, but you can all see it. <laughs> Joking aside, this bike has enough Trekkie features to put it in Captain Kirk's good books. In fact, it's got ABP with a minnow link, an updated knock block and well executed frame storage. Now the bike is a full carbon affair and features fully guided internal cable routing as well as a SRAM universal derailleur hanger. Bolted onto the front of the bike is a pretty tidy looking one piece carbon bar and stem that comes with luxurious titanium hardware. Interestingly enough, Trek did carry out some testing to find out if riders, so me and you, could consistently roll our bars into the same place and Apparently not, we're maybe not as consistent as we'd like to think. So maybe having our bars locked into the same place may not be a bad thing. However, I do find it kind of funny, the idea that a bike comes with a small geometry adjustment, which apparently we definitely need, and bars that are stuck in the same place, which is actually, for my money, the more useful of the two adjustments. But hey ho, I'm sure it's gonna suit some people. For the geometry, much like the Rocky Mountain Element, which also features in this field test, it has numbers that would leave a lot of trail and enduro bikes red-faced and making excuses. The flip chip, which is at the base of the shock there, can steepen the seat and head tube angle by 0.4 of a degree, should you fancy it. Trek's ABP system delivers 120mm of travel via a trunnion mounted shock on the rear end. Now this system, in which a chainstay basically doubles up as a swing arm and is connected via a split pivot on the rear axle, is something of a mainstay on Trek's lineup and can be seen throughout their entire range, save for their 60mm travel Super XC race bike. For the suspension, it's a pretty solid affair. An RTS bike came with a SID fork, which has 35mm legs and features the race day charger damper. So it's lightweight, it's aggressive, but does it pack a punch or is it more of a welterweight wet lettuce? Well, we've come to Pemberton. Levy and I have been riding this bike nonstop, bickering about four-way stops, his love of Nickelback and why his Mini is a joke. And we think we've got some answers. So let's get to it. Those are the details on the Trek Top Fuel. Let's dig into the good stuff. How does this bike climb? This is a great climbing bike. In fact, it's the most efficient on climbs in terms of our efficiency test and the third fastest on technical climbs. Mm -hmm. It's got a good platform. I don't think it's, well, I don't know how you'd feel, Levi, but I don't know if it's quite as smooth off the top as the Rocky. It's not as happy to go into its stroke. It's that bit more supportive and that comes back to you under power. Yeah, the Rocky definitely feels a little deeper for sure, a little more forgiving. I would say that it's a combination of that firmish suspension. It's not too firm, it's about right. Mm -hmm. And the position that the bike puts you in, Henry. Yeah. Yeah, You. I just, it's a little bit lower front end. Um, when I'm on that bike, I just want to pedal hard. Yeah, totally. It feels far more, hmm, what would be the word? 
kind of alive on the flatter stuff, yeah. especially through flat turns, undulating terrain. This bike really wants, it makes you want to go very, very quickly. Yeah. We've got some pretty good technical climbs around here. How's this bike do when it's all slippery and rooty and just a mess of junk? You know, on the technical climbs, there are two, I would say there are two chief elements that affect it. Like I said, it doesn't seem to be quite as, um, as sensitive as something like the Rocky or the Santa Cruz for that matter, although it is still very adequate. The other thing is, it's getting to that stage, these reach numbers, effective top two numbers, slack seat tubes, yada, yada, yada. It's getting to the stage where, it, for the large, I'm six foot, it felt almost too long in the seated position. Getting to that point where it's hard to manipulate my weight and put it on the front axle through kind of technical switchbacks without feeling like it could be a little bit shorter to help help me exaggerate my weight a bit more. Yeah, for me, honestly, on those tight switchbacks, to compare two bikes at opposite ends of the spectrum, you get the Rocky and then you have this Trek. On the Rocky and the Niner, actually, on both of those bikes, you're in a more upright position. You're just, it feels like you're just happy to turn it around the corner more, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But when I was on that Trek, I felt like I was going quicker through the technical stuff and again, I think that just comes down to the position and the pedaling ability of the bike. It's funny because on paper, the Rocky and the Trek, they look so similar. Yeah. But I think they're not the on two, the trail. On the trail, they're very different. And of the two, if there was one that you want to double up duties as an XC race bike, I'm not saying you'd want that. But if you were to do an XC race, I would rather choose the Trek. So you're talking about this bike as if it could be potentially do the odd XC race, but let's talk about the weight. Because that's something in the cross country world, weight does matter a lot more than you might think in some other yeah. realms. So how about this bike? Where does it stack up? Yeah, I mean, between the Rocky and the Trek, you're not splitting hairs that the Rocky is lighter than the Trek. Mm. Wait, the Rocky is lighter than the Trek? Mm. That's pretty funny because the Rocky, I think, is far more capable on steep, yes, scary stuff. I would say so. And it's, it's funny because the Trek, it doesn't ride like a heavy bike. It rides like an efficient, you know, yeah. an efficient cold-blooded killer. It is yeah. so much, it feels like it's got so much purpose going forward, especially under acceleration. But I think that'd be the one it might just color that argument a bit. Yeah. Let's move on to the descending portion because we are reviewing down country bikes and that's the down part. We already talked about the country part. That's a good, that's a good one. You like that? That's good. Yeah, yeah. So how about you? How does this bike descend? So if I go back and look at previous treks that I've tested over the last you know, three, four or five years, one of the things that I've always said about the suspension is that it feels too deep and too forgiving. And I know for some people listening, they might say, how can that possibly be? But what happens is, is it takes away from the bike's ability to respond to what you want it to do, you know? Um, this is the first Trek that I've ridden in a long time with that rear suspension. I wouldn't change a thing, Henry. Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't add any volume spacers. Recommended pressure works just fine. I didn't have to flip the switch. Yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed with the rear of the bike. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this is the thing that strikes you with the Trek is it's such a precise feeling bike. Yeah. You know, it's not something that you just, you get bounced around it. it da it's damped really well. Yeah. I think for some people that are more comfort orientated, then it might, I would say, potentially even be damped. It's, da it's damped adequately for a bike that can be pushed hard as it can be. Yeah. I think some people might find it a bit firm, yeah. especially compared to some of the other softer bikes on test. Yeah. Um, but it is an excellent descender. It's the poise, it's, it's got a great four and a half balance. And compared to something like the Niner, which we're joking around, didn't really feel like it really had that much character. It felt mm -hmm. like it didn't really represent anything. The Trek really has character. This is a capable bike that we encourage you to ride really fast up, down, and with a feeling of, yeah, precision that you don't really get with some of the other bikes. Yeah, some of the component specs, are, we're gonna get to that in a, in a few minutes, but when you're descending on these bikes, I mean, they're not made to, you know, do 8,000 foot descents down like gnarly rock faces and stuff, but this bike has four piston brakes, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Kaz, I know you and I have argued about that in the past, yeah, but here we are. I do agree. Yeah, it has a SID on the front, which it ended up getting a bit of bushing play, but damping wise, I'm always very impressed with that SID. So I think those two things, yeah, they're a big factor in how this bike descends so well. Absolutely, I think in some ways this bike is damned if it does and damned if it isn't because we complain about the weight. Yeah. But then on the Rocky, we're saying, oh, they've made these all these very small tech spectacles, like the smaller brakes and the narrower rims. And then we're saying, oh, wouldn't it be better if it was a bit burlier? They're in a really difficult position. Yeah. I would say one thing that, you know, with the Trek, yes, it has got the bigger brakes and the wider rims, etc. 
but it's also the second fastest to sender. It, yeah. it, it does come back to you. It's not like you just spend that weight and you know you don't get thanked for it. And, would, um, is the weight worth it, Henry? It sounds like you're saying the weight on this bike is worth it. Absolutely. Or would you rather have this bike weigh 24 pounds? No, no. I think this bike is sensibly spec'd. I think the only place to save weight, you know me, is I get rid of the axis. But apart from that, it's light, it's a great blend. And I think, um, you know, it's not that dissimilar, it's that dissimilar from bikes being raced under people like Nino Scherter with that new Scott, it's 120 mil. These, these cross country race bikes are getting longer travel and some of them are getting a bit heavier. Mm -hmm. This bike certainly doesn't ride like a heavy bike. So you already said you're not a huge fan of the access on this bike, but let's dig into some more of those component choices. What stands out? I mean, there are some, well, let's start with the negative stuff. The knock block, there's, uh, in terms of to ride it, you will never notice any difference. However, you know, this bike, it comes with the one piece bar, which is gorgeous. And the shape of it is really good. Perfect. But then if you don't like the one piece bar, you've then got to, like I did, get the hacksaw out on those stem spaces and nullify them. And it's like, this is an expensive bike. Right you now, shouldn't be getting a hacksaw. <laughs> Somebody at track is going, oh God, they're taking a hacksaw to that stuff. Well, I don't, can I just say, I don't want to take a hacksaw to the bike. I'm not yeah. there. Oh, give so me an excuse. They put these stupid tabs on and I'm, it's my duty to hacksaw them off. Yeah. <laughs> they make a little spacer that sits on top. It's to, it's designed to allow you to run knock clock with a regular stem. But it didn't come with it. And it's because you have a nice bar that you don't need to change. Yeah, but if you do want to change it. Yeah. Why would you want to change it? Have you seen that the one piece carbon bar? The reason I it because that one piece carbon bar, which you come on to, is gorgeous and the shape is good. But I was getting, problems with comfort in my wrists. I'll take it, you give it to me, I'll take it. And so I changed it, and to change it, I had to get the old hacksaw out, which is more fatigue on the old wrists. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is a well-shaped bar, but I was yeah. curious. I think it is comfortable, I think it is well-shaped. I think actually it was the organic pads that came on the bike that was yeah. the culprit for my yeah. uh, bit. I want to talk about three things now that I like, now that Henry has covered a whole lot of negative. Go on. Okay, so first off, we've mentioned it already, the four piston brakes. I think if we go back, we'll find some dumbass in these videos talking about how short travel bikes don't need four piston brakes. 300 pound Casimir here needs four piston brakes on his trail bike. I like to be able to stop easily, quickly, just be in control. <laughs> four piston brakes on this bike, they make sense with the geometry. It makes it a very capable bike. Also, let's mention the storage compartment in the down tube. It's basically the same as specialized SWAT box, except they use a lever on the side instead of a, a hinge to close it and open it. I prefer this lever. It's a little bit better, but that's neither here nor there. The other thing that I like, and I suspect that Henry and I might disagree on this for about the thousandth time, yeah. Axis drivetrain. AXS. AXS, <laughs> have I been pronouncing it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I personally love the cleanness of this. There's no wires anywhere. I know it's heavier, Henry. I know you have to charge the batteries, but you just push a button. It goes, <laughs> I'm done. It's perfect. Okay, I'm not gonna say why I don't think it's wrong because quite frankly, life's too short. But one thing I did really like is on the ABP, where previously there's been kind of big spanner interfaces. Now they've got a really nice cassette tool to take apart the rear end. Yeah. And I think that is a really nice touch. Yeah. One last thing before we move on, we've mentioned it before, but I think this is worth mentioning it again because it's obviously a very big component on the bike. The fork, you know, SIDS, they've been out for a, a year or something now, and we're still seeing SIDS with bushing play. We've got two bikes here, which isn't acceptable. So there you go. We're talking about Trek here, so we know their catalog usually runs deep, so a lot of different models to choose from. Is there one that stands out as a particularly good value? I think there is the Fuel 9.8 XT. So basically it goes for six and a half US and it does without AXS. How That's do you even ride it? Heaven forbid, <laughs> I know. Oh Those my God. antiquated shift cables. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ye oldie <Click>. time derailleur. <laughs> yeah. so basically that is a thousand dollars cheaper than the AXS version. The Axis version, sorry Mike. I can tell it does, you know, it is great. It's, a lot of people really like it, but for a thousand bucks, it's a bit cheaper. Yeah. It's time to talk pros and cons. So we're going to toss it over to Mr. Sunshine and Rainbows. Henry He's going to let us know the good things about this bike. This is a really versatile bike that will encourage you to have fun, whether you're riding things on the more technical side of cross country, dare I say down country, or more undulating terrain. It feels sharp, responsive and alive, and it is just a great bike to ride. It's going to encourage you to push on descents and climbs.
We talked about how this bike sort of lights a fire under your ass. It's a great bike if you like to pedal hard, but it's not light. You know, I want it to be lighter. On the same hand, Henry, I mean, I talked about how I like those wide carbon wheels and I realized that I can't have this without having this. So I'm a little conflicted there, but it would be nice if it was a little lighter. Last thing, knock block. Yes, it's improved. No, I don't care. Get out of there. All right, well, let's wrap this up by figuring out who this bike is for. Henry, who do you see as the ideal candidate for the new Trek Top Fuel? You know, it's kind of me. I'm not gonna say it's, it's us. It <laughs> it is. You know, I was, I was having some lighthearted japer at the Canyon's expense earlier on saying it was for off-road bike cycling. Mm -hmm. This is for real mountain bikers who happen to want, to want something more efficient. Very similar to the Rocky, but this is more, it's more alive. It probably isn't something, if you want to go out by yourself and just smash miles, I can think of few better candidates. This is a really, really good bike. Yeah, I would agree. All right. Nice job, Trek. That's a wrap on the Top Fuel. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our field test content. We've got a whole bunch more videos on the way. As always, thanks for watching.